In this episode, we will take up one of the well-known creation hymns of the ancient Indian Vedas. But we will be looking at this hymn from a slightly different point of view. We will view this as a novel way of relating to God which is quite different from the conventional approach adopted by the majority world religions. While doing that, we will also clear off many misconceptions about this approach and show how this is one step forward in the journey of ultimate realization through the path of devotion. The Man with Thousand Heads In the previous episode, we discussed one of the creation hymns of ancient Indian Vedas, namely the Nasadiya Sukta. It was almost a description of the emergence of our universe and has several parallels in the modern scientific theory of the origin of the world, namely the Big Bang Theory. Nasadiya Sukta is just one of the many creation hymns that one finds in the Vedas. The descriptions in these hymns are given from varieties of perspectives, as seen by an intellectually motivated person, as viewed by a devotionally oriented person, as picturized by a poetically endowed person, and so on. In this episode, I will briefly look at another so-called creation hymn. It is the Purusha Sukta, which literally means the hymn of the man. This is the 90th Sukta from the 10th Mandala of Rig Veda, comprising of 16 mantras. This is a highly revered Sukta considered by the devout as the real creation hymn and given lot of religious importance. But it's a highly poetical hymn loaded with lot of subtle imageries which are often taken literally, ending up in lot of controversies and debates. Even the erstwhile Aryan invasion theory proponents take this as a proof of domination of the conquering Aryans over the conquered native Indians. Though the Aryan invasion theory is now defunct, one can still see its influence on some of the Indian scholars who wrote commentaries on this sukta less than a century ago. Rather than viewing this sukta from a creation theory perspective, the way it is traditionally done, I would like to present a slightly different way of looking at it. It is one of the ways a devout person may like to relate to God, the God as defined in the Vedas. Abrahamic religions, that is, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, have just one way of relating to God. They envision a personified God, who is the creator of everything, nourisher of all and the lord of the entire world. These religions insist that the only relation that the created beings can have with this creator God is by serving him with total unquestioning surrender. This kind of relation with God is not alien to devout Indians. They call it Dasya Bhava. The way an obedient servant relates to his or her master. But this Dasya Bhava is not the only way a faithful Indian looks at God. In the journey of devotion, Dasya Bhava is only a beginning. When one progresses on this path, one goes through the next stage where the devotee starts seeing God in everything. But this seeing God in everything is often mistaken as pantheism or polytheism by many people who cannot come to terms with any relation other than the typical master-servant relation of the Abrahamic religions. But these are totally different concepts. There is a difference between viewing everything individually as God and perceiving the same God in everything. 
Though Abrahamic religions forbid such a relation, I have read about even devout Christian missionaries and Islamic Sufi saints inadvertently getting into this kind of relation with God. In this talk, I will try to view this Purusha Sukta from this point of view as a way of seeing God in everything. Maybe we can call it Vishwarupa Bhava. That makes lot of sense not just because that's the way God is defined in the Upanishads but also it allows one to see unity in diversity enabling him or her to embrace the entire world not just the humans not just the living beings but the entire gamut of living and non-living entities as a collective whole. With this view let us start this highly poetic hymn. It goes like this. That Purusha has uncountable heads, uncountable eyes and limbs. He pervades the entire universe and stretches even beyond. Sahasra Shirsha Purusha Sahasraksha Sahasrapa Sabhumim Vishwata Vritva Dashangulam Atyatishtat Who is this Purusha? Here the word Purusha does not mean man as it literally means. In this context, Purusha means the one who resides in Pura or the body. Not just one body, but every body. That means Purusha is someone who resides in all physical bodies. Remember the episode where we talked about the Atma entering the bodies as individual soul or Jivatma? I am referring to episode 18 titled Does God Have a Form? That Atma is the Purusha talked about here. If this Purusha resides in all the bodies, then the heads, eyes and the limbs of all those bodies are nothing but the heads, eyes and limbs of this Purusha. That is what this mantra says. Where does such a Purusha reside? Does he reside in some heaven? No, he is all over, all over the universe and even beyond because he is omnipresent. He is not confined to some limited space. Is he just someone who resides in various bodies? No, he is not just that. He is also the bodies as well and all that we see around. The Sutta confirms this by saying, all this, that is, whatever that exists now, whatever that existed in the past, as well as whatever that would come into existence in the future, is nothing but this Purusha. He is immortal. He never dies. He appears to grow when the beings grow by consuming food. Idam sarvam yad bhutam yad bhavyam purusha eva. Amritatvasya Ishana Yat Annina Atirodhati. That is how this God is seen as an embodiment of everything around. But does it not make the God just limited to whatever that we can perceive? These words, these beings, inanimate things, etc. The Sukta clarifies that by saying, Whatever we perceive is just a small portion of this enormous God or Purusha. Though what we perceive goes through changes and has a beginning and an end, the portion that we cannot perceive is really unlimited, unchanging and ever-present in some dimension beyond our perception. Etavan asya maima Purusha atha jayan Vishwa Bhutani Asya Pada Asya Tripat Divi Amrita. This description of God as an all encompassing being has influenced even later Indian scriptures such as Bhagavad Gita. For example, the Bhagavad Gita describes God as The God has hands everywhere, He has legs, eyes, mouths, ears everywhere. In fact, is all pervading. 
सर्वत पाणीपादम तत्सर्वतोक्षिशिरोमुखम सर्वत श्रुतिमत्लोके सर्वृत्तिषति भगवद्गीता थर्टीन पॉइंट थर्टीन दैट इज हाउ गॉड इज व्यूड एज ए बीइंग दैट परवेड्स एवरीथिंग लिविंग एज वेल एज नॉन लिविंग फॉर्मलेस एज वेल एज फॉर्म एंड ऑब्वियसली मच मोर But how did this multifaceted world that we normally perceive emerge from this abstract purusha? That is the usual theme of creation hymns. But this is a dumb question in this context, since it presupposes the unity of all living and non-living beings as one entity, namely purusha, as if all these things pre-existed in that one and only purusha. but the sages and the divine beings were curious to know about the creation of this world they had their own way of explaining this abstract purusha emerging as multifaceted perceptible world these sages are very much used to fire rituals involving animal sacrifice so they imagine a fire ritual which they call it as purusha meeda literally a fire ritual in which the purusha himself is the sacrificial offering in a highly poetic way the sages explain various things that emerged from this purusha as the ritual goes on to become the dualistic world that we are in i'll skip those details here and finally this is how the purusha sukta appears in the rigveda along with its traditional recitation i have retained only the first few mantras that have covered in this discussion om sahasra shirsha purushah sahasraksha sahasra pade sabhumim vishvato vritva अत्यतिषदशांगुलूतमृतस्ेशानोज्याजागिश्चपूरषादस्वाभूता ृपादस्यामृतूर्ध्व उदयपुरुष पादस्वात्न तथो विश्व व्यक्राम शाशनाशने अभी तस्मा विराड